Lights and signs are an elemental part of Times Square, and so are the huge crowds. But despite the endless flow of people on the street level, there's one Times Square building that's almost empty. Floors upon floors are unoccupied, and it's been that way for decades. You probably know one Times Square because of what's on the roof. But the story of this odd building extends well beyond its corner on 42nd Street. Every year, around a million people pack the area to watch this crystal ball drop on New Year's Eve. Jeff Strauss is in charge of that production. When I started in 1995, it was a ball coming down a flagpole and some confetti. And the whole tradition goes back to 1904 when this building where I am today was actually constructed by the New York Times as their official headquarters right here in what was then called Long Acre Square. The other newspapers thought that was crazy. You're coming up here to Long Acre Square, it's the home of the horse and carriage industry, there's nothing happening up here. So they decided they had to have a big celebration, something, a real corporate promotion, show everybody that they were right here. And what they came up with was New Year's Eve. The first few years they tried fireworks, but those were quickly banned by the city. So Walter Palmer, the Times head electrician, was asked to come up with a new idea. And he created this lighted time ball that would drop at midnight. It attracted hundreds of thousands of people immediately to Times Square to celebrate the new year. The Times lasted less than 10 years in the building, but it was quickly becoming an attraction, and people would jam into the area to watch important news zip around the news ticker at the bottom. In New York's Times Square, crowds gather on election night as returns mount an Eisenhower landslide finds Ike winning state after state. As the neighborhood picked up a more seedy reputation, the building got one too. In 1961, The New Yorker published a talk of the town story, which reported that there was a time when a speakeasy was going full blast in one of the basements, when the FBI, this was during the Second World War, was holding pistol practice in a basement and using a seventh floor office to trap German spies. In 1963, the Allied Chemical Corporation bought the building and then tore off the terracotta facade. At the time, Ada Louise Huxtable, an architecture critic, said it had a no-style skin of laboratory white marble with the look of cut cardboard. Allied wanted to make it into a tourist destination. You haven't really seen New York until you visit the Allied Chemical Tower. Number one, Times Square, Tuesday through Saturday, 11 a.m. through 8 p.m. You haven't really seen New York until you visit the Allied Chemical Tower, right in the center of things, at number one, Times Square. I think we get uh, attached to places and they embed in our memories. That's Lynn Segallen, a professor of real estate at Columbia. She says that even after the outcry over the new facade, the building remained an important landmark in the area. The iconic nature of it stays very much even, stable, uh, rememberable part of, a part of the history of the city. It, it almost doesn't matter who owns it, uh, as long as it doesn't get torn down. But the area continued to change. And by 1974, when Allied sold the building, the image of Times Square was the one from the movie Taxi Driver. I was here in the 70s getting my first illegal ID. And I remember going to 42nd Street and being scared to death. People were barting up their windows. And it was one large, massive group. And the horses and fleets on horses, you get picked up. It was a scary thing to go to. For decades, politicians tried to capitalize on that fear and made plans to reshape the area. It has really been a horror for the city that when people came here and went to see that place they thought was the center of the world, it wasn't there. And what was there instead was really horrible and affirmatively scary to tourists and to New Yorkers and kept giving us a bad name. Every time there was a new mayoral election, there'd be the sweep of the prostitutes and the pimps and the Johns and they all back on the street shortly thereafter. The city tried all kinds of strategies to clean it up, and they all proved unsuccessful until they decided to put in place a real estate strategy, which was to eradicate the bad uses and put in place the good uses. That real estate strategy of buying out the owners of the so-called bad use businesses eventually took hold. 
but by 1995, the owners of One Times Square were in bankruptcy. And at that point, not many people wanted it. But the financial services firm Lehman Brothers did. And Lehman saw the value as a billboard, and most of the real estate people missed the significance of that building. Lehman flipped the primary purpose of the building from an office space to a billboard, and the strategy paid off. Two years later, the nearly empty building earned them a 300% profit when Lehman sold one Times Square to Jamestown Properties, which has continued to lease to only a small number of occupants. Michael Phillips, Jamestown's chief operating officer, explains why. The building is occupied on the lower three floors by Walgreens with some storage on the upper floors and the one Times Square production management team for uh, New Year's Eve uh, occupy the top of the building. So um, it made most sense when you cover all the windows with signs to, <laughs> to not have it be so occupied. So how much are the signs worth? I don't think I really want to quote numbers. Filings from 2012 show that the signs generate over $23 million annually, and that accounts for 85% of the building's total revenue. The property itself has been valued at between $378 million and $495 million. In some ways, it's fitting that there's an expensive hollow shell sitting in the middle of Times Square. The area is often derided as a place of spectacle, and not soul. And it's hard to feel nostalgic about a building that's been ugly for such a long time. But there's also something inspiring and mysterious about the building. And as the ball comes down on New Year's Eve, it'll be over walls and beams and floors that house nothing, except for stories about the history of New York City.